The following interview was conducted with Richard A. Kozier, Dean, the Craner School of Management and Leeds Professor of Management for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, February the 18th, 2010 in Stewart Center, B26. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Good afternoon, Dean Kozier, and Catherine, I thank you very much. I'm, start, I'm honored to be here. My pleasure. Um, tell us a little bit about where and when you were born and your parents and early years. I was born in uh, Jackson, Michigan, uh, May 18th, 1947. Parents were Roy and Wilma Kozier, and I'm an only child. Uh, so I grew up in, in Jackson and went to grade school in Jackson, uh, junior high and high school, and uh, so I, I essentially am a one-town person as far as my uh, years tell us, of Well, tell us about up. grade school and what you do in high school. How is it? Student clubs or anything? Tell us about high school. Any teachers that you could recall? Well, uh, I certainly enjoyed high school, both uh, academically and socially. I uh, played baseball in high school and wasn't very good, but did that and uh, just uh, tried to keep my grades up and also, uh, you know, uh, I made some very, very close friends in high school I still correspond with and uh, and that's been a big benefit. Sure, that's right. And then uh, weren't you decide to go to Loyola? How did you make a decision on that? Huh? Well, actually, I went to Michigan State for my oh. undergraduate degree. Oh, uh, Michigan, degree. then the life of it. Right, okay. Went to Michigan State, and uh, well, of course, it was in Michigan. My dad uh, uh, said I could go anywhere I wanted to as long as it was in the state of Michigan. Uh, and I think I've uh, used that with my children as well as the local state tuition issues. But went to Michigan State and spent four years there, graduated with a packaging technology degree, and uh, joined that. I was a member of Beta Theta Pi Social Fraternity. I still have great friends from that experience. Uh, did all right with the grades and I uh, was an engineer when I graduated. Uh, what was what, the, that major, tell us a little about the packaging, what's for the researchers, they might be interested in that. Well, it's a somewhat unique major as far as universities go. And there are two types of packaging majors. One is a more marketing focus and another is a technical focus. And the technical focus is very engineering related. And it involves uh, packaging uh, high cost materials so that they are delivered in one piece. And uh, it was a great opportunity, frankly, to uh, get involved with uh, testing of materials. And we had laboratories where uh, how much fun can you have when you, when you actually are told to break something, you know, and, and see what it takes. So and they we, want you to do it. And they want you to do it. <laughs> so we did that, but uh, went to Western <laughs> Electric Company in uh, Chicago with, with my packaging technology degree. and. Of course, we had a laboratory there and a lot of colleagues from Michigan State and uh, we saved quite a bit of money for the company because of the, uh, the modern packaging materials that were available were not being utilized very much by Western Electric. So we could take a $50 package and for $3 give more protection to some of these uh, electronic uh, instruments. And so we were heroes there for a while at the uh, company. Riding the wave, right? Yeah. We were, <laughs> <laughs> we were popular, so I did, did that, and I actually went to Loyola during my time at Western Electric and uh, earned my MBA at night uh, while working at uh, full-time. Uh, that plant, of course, is closed now, isn't it? Been it was the Hawthorne plant, right. famous for the Hawthorne studies, and yes, it is right. closed. It just shows you what can happen. At one point, that plant had over 30,000 employees. When I was there, it had 15,000 in one location. Wow. And uh, a few years back, it was just closed. Yeah, I know. Then what, th what came on after that? Is that? Did you go on for your PhD in the next? Well, during my uh, MBA program, I met a fellow named Verl Franz, probably doesn't remember me at all, but halfway through my studies, uh, he was teaching a course in organization behavior and leadership. And uh, we became uh, friends, uh, confidants, and he said, why don't you consider getting a PhD, Rick? And I'd never even given that any thought. I said, gee, Professor, that uh, seems like kind of an odd career. And he said, well, um, he said, I think you're pretty good in academics and seem to enjoy this uh, material, so you know, maybe you ought to give it a look. So I uh, essentially uh, applied to uh, some Big Ten programs based on his advice and uh, ended up going to the University of Iowa. Uh, I quit my engineering job, and my dad, who had been with the telephone company for 40 years, called me up and he said, oh my gosh, you're not quitting this engineering job, making all this money. And I said, yeah, Dad, I think I'm going to go back for more studies in my PhD. He went, oh, no. Of course, years later, he said that was the best advice he ever gave me. <laughs> oh, any special things that you recall when out there in Iowa? 
Well, that was your one, first visit out there. Uh, I, yeah, I was not from Iowa, and yeah. the only time I lived there was during my doctoral program. And just wonderful people. Uh, it was a nice small program. I like that. Uh, we only had about 35 students in the entire doctoral program. So one of the benefits, uh, uh, we all took the all the basic business courses. So I took economics and accounting and all the business functional areas, which I think helped me in my career later on, even though I was an org behavior major, sure. uh, org behavior and statistics. Right. Uh, it was really a benefit to take all of the business courses. Yeah, it kind of made a nice blend for that. What, did you have any, was you in the military? Did you uh, no, not, not in the military. When okay. I got my engineering uh, job, uh, uh, Western Electric had a lot of contract work with the government and I was uh, given an occupational deferment. So I would have served if asked, but um, I was doing this, uh, apparently doing a pretty valuable function because uh, we, we packaged a lot of the uh, products and materials that, that helped the government in sure, various right. efforts. Sure, okay. right, How about your career path? Tell us about the career path before you came to Purdue. Well, when I- After uh, you got your PhD. Well, just before the actual finishing of my PhD, uh, I left uh, University of Iowa. I had a few pages left on my dissertation. I started at Notre Dame in 1975, 1976. And I always tell people uh, a big uh, uh, part of my life was having Joe Montana in my first management class. And of course, famous quarterback. And uh, Joe uh, had a little trouble on my first exam, but uh, I got together with him and had a couple other students help him out a little bit. And he studied real hard. He was a great guy. and. Uh, did a wonderful job, as I recall, when the day was done, and I always tell people, and my career moved on as well. <laughs> That's right. You moved on together, right? That's right. <laughs> Moving forward. Yeah. A year after, though, I only spent one year at Notre Dame, and I did complete my, uh, my doctorate officially in 1976 from the University of Iowa. And a friend of mine uh, named John Applin, who I knew had known at Iowa and still have a, a close relationship with it to this day, uh, was at Indiana University. And he said, why don't you come on down here and interview? We've got a doctoral program. Notre Dame didn't have one in the business school at the time. And I said, okay, and I'm not really looking to leave. I like Notre Dame, but I'd be happy to come on down. So I ended up going down for an interview and then took a position in 1976 as an assistant professor uh, at Indiana University's business school. And of course, ended up staying there about 17 years. It was named Kelly at that time, though, was it? It was just the business no, school? No, just before the school was named. And, right. uh, I was uh, kind of thrust into uh, administration a little earlier than most. Uh, I had uh, been promoted to associate professor with tenure in 1982. And in 1984, I tell people I was walking by the office of the dean and he waved me in. And it turns out a couple of days prior, he'd asked somebody else to be the chairman of the management department and a more senior faculty member than myself. And uh, this individual who was asked to do this job accepted, but didn't sleep for two straight days. So he told the dean that uh, he needed some sleep, so he uh, turned down the job as department chairman. And I think I was the next person by the door of the dean because he called yeah. me in and said, Rick, you're only an associate professor, but would you like to be the department chairman of the management department? It was a big group, had about 25 faculty, uh, about 25 to 30 doctoral students, a uh, uh, big shop. And so I started that in 1984. Very good. And just happened to look up and you were passing the corridor. And you I think so. <laughs> that's, how I, that's how I remember it anyway. In 1986, uh, I was promoted to full professor. Uh, okay. But I had a very active research program and was promoted all the way up to uh, through full professor on my research program. Yeah, that's very good. Thank you. That school has, gr has grown. Was it grown, growing by the time you were there too? So it was fairly large. We had a program in Indianapolis as well as one in Bloomington. and. Uh, it, we had uh, over a thousand master students and you know, five or six hundred undergraduates and you know, probably 25, 30 doctoral students. Yeah. So it's a big program. Sure. And then from there you went to Oklahoma, right? Well, as a, I was the associate dean for academics in 1990 at, at IU. Mm -hmm. uh, and by 1992, the, the dean who I had served under, Jack Wentworth, was moving on. And, Looked like uh, IU was going to go outside of the institution for a new dean, so I had one of those career choices to make. You know, stay inside, be the associate dean longer, maybe go back to the faculty, or see if I uh, might try being a dean right. somewhere. And I uh, found this opportunity at the University of Oklahoma to be their dean. And so in 1993, January 1st, I started as a dean and Fred E. Brown chair of the University of Oklahoma. And how would, did you enjoy being out there? I enjoyed Oklahoma quite yeah. a bit. I'm a golfer, so I had the chance to play 
several days of golf. People are surprised to learn about 280 days a year it's sunny in Oklahoma. A little different than the Midwest, uh, but I kind of miss the Midwest. Yeah, I know. Born and raised in, I think you did. Were you, you were married by that time, of course? Actually, I, I, I was married in 1969 to okay. uh, Ray Patel, who uh, uh, we uh, had two, two boys, and we were divorced in 1984, or 1985, 1985. Okay. And then I remarried in 1986 to uh, Lynn Hayes, and uh, we're married today and have two wonderful girls. Oh, that's, where were your two sons? Did they come to Purdue or? No, my like... older boy is an IU grad, okay. and he lives up in uh, Michigan and Grand Rapids, and the uh, uh, younger boy is also in Michigan in the uh, Muskegon area. And he's a Central Michigan Business School grad. Okay. They keep in the Michigan area, I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about when we moved to the School of Management. Now, first, when you came in August of 99, about your responsibilities and some challenge, and why don't you take it from there a little bit? Well, uh, again, August 1st was my first uh, day on the right. job, uh, 1999. Again, I was just honored and felt privileged to be the dean. Uh, also, uh, was the Leeds Professor of Management, which is a separate appointment from the dean's appointment based on some research uh, prowess it had in the past. Uh, but uh, the, the main uh, job, one, so to speak, was to fund a new building. Uh, Cranert, uh, great program, but the physical facility was really non-competitive. And uh, that not only hurt us with recruiting and uh, retention of, of the best students, but it was uh, really not the best environment for learning uh, with the state-of-the-art uh, uh, resources that a lot of other business schools had. Uh, so that was the job, and uh, I'm happy to say within about a year and a half, uh, we had uh, the $35 million project fully funded. Uh, the main gift, the lead gift, was from Jerry Rawls uh, uh, from California. He had a company called Finisar, and uh, Jerry provided $10 million of the $35 million uh, in one check, which we greatly appreciated. So uh, in 2003, we were able to dedicate and open uh, Rawls Hall. All right. What about when they have those things you do a little bit before the, the uh, announcement and, and yet you got to know alumni. Is that how that helped a little bit when you came, right? This is really a team effort. Right. Uh, people and talk. I, I was going to talk about Cranor at the Frontier, which is the program that you're talking right. about. Well, it's part of that program. It actually right. morphed into the big uh, Purdue campaign after Martin Jeske came, but it sure. started out this way. Right. But people talk about a major project requiring what they call a giving pyramid. That means you need different uh, levels of. Uh, donations and uh, at the lower levels you need a lot of people giving smaller amounts of money and then as you move upward larger amounts of money but fewer people and this uh, project at Rawls Hall was almost a perfect uh, definition of the pyramid at the top of course was Jerry Rawls 10 million dollar gift but we had a couple of five million dollar gifts we had some uh, other uh, million dollar gifts uh, other large six-figure gifts it was a wonderful uh, effort by our alumni and the uh, development team and the faculty and staff to put together uh, what was really a, a valid and, and valuable resource for our students and faculty. Right, and also you had some local things because Wabash contributed. Wabash well, contributed those, significantly. Yes, right. two and a half million, as I recall. Right. Yeah, and then and when it, and you got that ar architecture portfolio. It's a wonderful building. We're yeah. very pleased. Uh, Goody Clancy from Boston did the primary architectural work on there, but Schuller also helped. And it's a it's a it's a great building for functional as well as aesthetics. Right, and the great the location could not be better. I no. mean, you just lucked out. You know? Well, although I must tell you a little side story here, when I was out raising money to uh, build Rawls Hall, we had the lot, uh, of course, picked out next to the uh, Cranert building, and. One of the first questions I got from the alumni was, you're not going to do anything to Harry's, are you? And uh, we said, no, that's the next block over, and we wouldn't dare interfere with Harry's. So. <laughs> it grandfathered in, and it's staying there, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> oh, let's, um, a couple things on the strategic plan that you got. Uh, want to make a couple comments on your strategic plan? Well, originally, uh, we, we were right in line with Martin Jiske's plan when he came as president that focused a lot on uh, resources that we needed to uh, uh, gather to be more competitive as a business school and as a university. So a lot of effort on the, uh, of course, I mentioned the building and on faculty uh, endowments, uh, scholarship money, uh, trying to uh, bring the resources to uh, help support our great programs. And so our strategic plan, I think when you boil it down, really focused on on building the infrastructure and the uh, uh, 
uh, resource base to uh, do what we needed to do here. Right, and that innovation, you're, it's great on your website. I mean, that's a, that's a really a nice lead into yeah. that. that looks of, course, of course, now we've, we've changed and, and developed into the new president's uh, sure. uh, plan, and the innovation, the student experience, globalization is now an extremely important uh, thing, uh, research with impact. Uh, we're, we're working hard on those areas now. Right, okay. Um, faculty recruitment. Uh, that was you, that. So you're sort of involved, in, pretty much involved in that to some extent. Right. We've recruited a lot of faculty. I don't know right. the number, but I, I would uh, say he's probably up in the 50s and 60s range, maybe higher from since I, I started as dean. That's critically important. Clearly, that you're going to have some turnover. People retire. Some people leave. Uh, others, uh, you know, may not make tenure. Sadly. Uh, so bringing in uh, competent, qualified new faculty is extremely important. Retaining the ones that we can who are uh, performing at a high level, uh, we, that's an equally important thing. But right. I think the faculty profile now is tremendous, and uh, we've brought in some great new people in nope, 10 years. You're right. Okay. How about um, <clears throat> the diversity in the school? Extremely important thing to me. Uh, one of the really nice parts of Craner that I, I just... Uh, uh, celebrate uh, and will forever is our business opportunity program. Right. Uh, of course, that was led by Cornell Bell. Bell for many, many years. Uh, 1970, he was appointed the director of the program, and uh, developed nice, great person. Great person. He won't find a more. You wouldn't find a more dedicated, committed person to a, a valuable cause ever. Sadly, passed away a little over a year ago. Right. But he's uh, he's remembered, and that program has helped provide an educational opportunity for many students from uh, underrepresented uh, uh, minority groups and um, you know I think there's about 900 alumni now right. and that's just I couldn't be prouder of that program past present and future All right and the nice thing is also for the researchers it's the papers have been turned over to the archives so we have mm. his papers and things of that sort that's which great. is really really that's been really very mm -hmm. nice mm -hmm. um, moving on the um, Rankings, you've got those on the home page, but that's mm -hmm. really kind of a key thing, isn't it, for every, everybody today? Right now, rankings are extremely important. Uh, I'd be curious to see how they play out in the future, and they've, right. uh, they've gathered a lot of interest. Uh, of course, uh, we are very proud in 2004, 2005 to be a number, the number one uh, program in a major category uh, in the Wall Street Journal, uh, and uh, we've done well over the years in Business Week and U.S. News and World Report. And Financial Times is another one too. Now, recently, we moved up 26 spots in Financial Times, and we're the see we're the ninth highest ranked uh, public business school in the U.S. And it's very nice to see that on the website because people talk about that and they say, "Well, I can't remember," but having it visible and available for people when they it's just really good. Yeah, it works I think out so extremely too. well. Mm -hmm. um, the, the German International School for Management Administration might make a couple of comments. The researchers may not be aware of that particular yeah. facility, which has been going for some time in Hanover. Yeah, uh, yeah. The uh, German International School of, of, Man of Management Administration, Gizma. Yeah. Um, may not be quite that, but Gizma is what we call it now. It's, it's been for years what we referred to it as, and uh, that started on August first, uh, nineteen ninety nine. Also, same day I started. And it was a really great vision. Uh, I give the, a lot of credit to people like uh, Dan Schendel and Jerry Lynch and um, former Dean uh, Dennis Widenauer to see that this could be a great uh, uh, global program for Craner and Purdue. And a very unusual setup that was um, funded by a foundation in Germany. So there, initially there was not an academic partner. It was Craner being funded by a, a, a foundation under a contract, and then we provided our MBA degree in 11-month format on location in Hanover, Germany. And we've been through uh, as our fourth contract now. We now have an academic partner, Leibniz University of Hanover, called LUH. And um, it's, uh, I think it's got sustainability. It's uh, about 600, 700 alumni. And it's just a wonderful program. Was the facility was already there? I mean, for, for the research, how did it, the facility was already there? They. Yeah. Is that correct? Or the facility not? is a building on their medical campus okay. in Hanover, Germany. So it, it's called a rotunda. It's a great building, but it was built um, as part of this medical research uh, campus and was available for us, so we leased it and still do. Do some of the uh, Craner students also go there, or how does the, is there some sort of an exchange? Well, one of the nice things about the program is the opportunity for students from West Lafayette to go to Hanover for what we call a module, which is an eight-week period, and likewise for some of the Gizma students to come back to um, 
Kumar Lewis Lafayette uh, for eight weeks and study. So we do have a pretty good exchange relationship. Yeah, okay. Um, the Dean's Advisory Council, uh, how the selection and length of service and input and, and a couple comments on that. That's been going for some time. Well, that was started by, I think maybe Keith Smith may have started that, but Dennis Widenauer had uh, certainly con continued it. And sure. So I inherited a great group of uh, alumni and others for advisors. And one of the great things about being a dean yeah, it's the ability to work with your alumni. They're just tremendous people, and we, I just thoroughly enjoy and love doing that. So uh, this is kind of a labor of love to have the advisory council meetings and, and work with those people. Uh, great advice, uh, competent, qualified, dedicated, committed people to Cranford and Purdue. Uh, we meet uh, twice a year. Uh, there's about 50 members of our Dean's Advisory Council. Uh, again, all great people. Uh, and then we have a Craner School Alumni Advisory Group as well called KSAA that also meets twice a year. And uh, to be a KSAA member, you have to be an alumnus. A Dean's Advisory Council member may or may not be a uh, Craner alum. Okay, all righty, okay. The, uh, I want to talk about some of the Craner School special events and programs, starting with the Craner Leadership Series, which was started in 2001. The first, your first speaker was Bill Russell. Well, one of the, you bring a few ideas with you when you've been a Dean before, uh, at that a different helps. institution, and right. I'd, I'd done this at, at Oklahoma. We had a, a nice event that was a, a dinner with a speaker. We'd invite alumni and local business people and students and others in, and uh, it really had kind of a grand event. We'd give awards out to uh, uh, friends and alumni, and so we decided to continue that. Tim Newton's been a real ally with me on that, uh, my uh, media and communications director. Uh, our first speaker was uh, Bill Russell. We did the first program in Indianapolis at about 400. Uh, people in attendance, and this was a stressful one for us because uh, Bill was flying in through Chicago and got uh, stuck in a thunderstorm on the ground and made it about 15 minutes before the dinner started. <laughs> and so Tim and I were literally, as they say, sweating bullets trying to uh, uh, work out an alternative plan in case in uh, case it didn't come. He didn't case come Bill through. didn't make it, but he did, <laughs> and so we got off to a. Great start, he did a wonderful job. But we've had uh, a nice program uh, throughout the years. Uh, you had some very good speakers. And the next yeah. one was you had to us, um, well, of course you've had uh, Tim, Tim Russert. Yeah, who came yeah and, uh, rest uh, in peace, what a, what a great person he was. And you, do you move it back and forth between Indianapolis and here? No, we now do it exclusively at the uh, Student Union, oh, are you? Okay. Memorial Union and, and West Lafayette on campus. And we get over 700 people now to sell out every year. Uh, so it's a, become kind of a natural event. They're that looking forward, right? People okay. look forward to, and we're <laughs> very, this, very pleased. Yeah, with. Ben Stein was a recent speaker. Of course, he was fabulous. That, see, he's, uh, I see his ads with his his buddy. <laughs> you may want to do a two one on one with him and <laughs> get Bill Russell there or something yeah, like that. Yeah, that yeah. would be interesting. Your distinguished lecture series. Talk a little about that one. Yeah. Well, we've uh, we've had a. a program for uh, ethics and social responsibility that I believe that's referring to that uh, we do in uh, partnership with the Ackerman Center from the College of Education and bring in about three speakers a year into this program. This is largely student focused. I'm a big proponent on integrity and ethics. Uh, I think our students uh, can't hear enough about integrity and ethics and uh, right. so these speakers focus on that particular topic and uh, one of our, uh, our most recent speakers was a fellow named Blake McCoskey who uh, has a company called Tom's Shoes. Uh, there's nobody named Tom, but it stands for Tomorrow's Shoes. And it's basically the, a blend of social responsibility and a great business model. He's making a lot of money selling shoes, but for every pair he sells, he gives away a pair to uh, a child in, in need around the world. And uh, you know, that, that's a great message. And so we've, that's been a very successful series. Lec Valenza spoke in that series in the right. past, did a wonderful job. Jerry Greenfield from Ben & Jerry's. Uh, and the great thing about Jerry was he brought ice cream for everybody, so he was a very popular <laughs> He's going to be speaker. invited back. <laughs> oh, you're uh, the executive education program, the Cranard Executive Education Program. Talk, just make a couple comments on that. For well, the researchers, they would. You know, I'm a big believer in, in adding value to uh, our stakeholders. And one of the nice things about executive education is it gives uh, non-traditional students a chance to get a Cranard degree. So we have a program ranging from our weekend program, which is for uh, largely for people within a three or four county uh, area around uh, West Lafayette to come in on the weekends and 
uh, over about uh, a little over 30 months, they can get their MBA degrees. Uh, it's been a very popular program. We offer that now once a year. I have 50 or 60 students in the program. Uh, a lot of uh, campus employees will, will take advantage of that. Right. Uh, all the way to our International Masters of Management program, which is a global executive program, partners with uh, Tilburg University, European University in Budapest, Central European University in Budapest, and also our Gizmo program in Germany. And that program has students recruited by all the institutions, and they rotate to the various campuses around the world uh, of our partners. And that's a 22-month program in which they get to earn a master's degree, not only from Crater, but they can pick one of the other institutions as well. Gee, that sounds great. Yeah, that's a great program. Yeah. It's, it's highly ranked in the Financial Times. Yeah, that's um, your entrepreneur boot camp for, vet for veterans with disabilities. This, some, this is something new. Very new, and what a, what a, a great thing. I mentioned our desire to add value and right. give back. Um, I became aware a little over a year ago by one of my fellow deans that had me the dean of university, or Florida State University and uh, that this program existed. It's the Entrepreneurship Boot Camp for Veterans with Disabilities. We call it the EBV program. And she said that they had a group of uh, business schools that had, had uh, started to do this, a consortium, and they were looking for a quality business school in the Midwest. And I said, well, you know, what's it about? She said, well, uh, veterans who are officially disabled from uh, after 2001, largely the Iraqi and Afghan uh, uh, situations that uh, uh, were producing, sadly, casualties, uh, uh, were uh, in need of uh, some education on how to start their own business or run a family business. And so they had stepped up and wanted to know if we were interested. And I said, yeah, it sounds great to me. And she said, well, the one condition is that the veterans cannot pay anything. Everything is gratis, is provided for them. And uh, my, I think my response is, what other way would there be for this? So we raised the money for the first year. It was offered in August of 2009. Right. For the first time, we had 14 disabled veterans as part of the program. Uh, Congress, Congressman Steve Boyer spoke, uh, Lieutenant Governor Skillman, uh, President Cordova. Uh, it was a great, great program. And um, how did you recruit oh, the, uh, did you stay, how did you get the, the vet, were they from Indiana? No, or? no, they're from around the country. Okay. Uh, Syracuse University is the coordinating school for oh, this. Oh, okay. And we actually have a central uh, uh, recruiting and, and screening function that they provide. And then the, based on the timing and region, the students come to, there are uh, six pro, uh, campuses now around the country that uh, are part of this, UCLA, Texas A&M. Florida State, uh, Syracuse, UConn, and uh, Purdue. And um, what's the length of the program? Was it for a week or how long? Was There's a three-week distance oh. learning component uh, prior to them being on campus. Then they're on campus for uh, about eight days. Uh, and after that, we mentor for about a year afterward. But we'll, we'll mentor forever if we need to. These yeah, are right. great people. And uh, it was a wonderful experience. We're going to do another one. Uh, this coming August, and I hope do them in perpetuity. And uh, just to show you how the, some people react uh, to this, well, the first program, one of our alumni, uh, a former B-52 pilot, and his spouse, Brick Hansen, uh, funded half the program by himself. Uh, the second year out, uh, uh, he contributed along with others, but we had a little, little bit yet to go, and we were up talking to one of our alumni, Sam Allen, who's the CEO of Deer, great person, and we're telling Sam about the program, and. Uh, Sam said, well, how, how, uh, how short are you for funding this coming August to make sure that we can do this again, Rick? And I said, well, right now, Sam, we're, I think we're $30,000 short. So uh, never, I don't think anybody's done this before. He reached in his pocket, pulled out a checkbook, wrote me a check for $30,000 and gave it to me and said, now you're fully funded for the summer. And he's committed to uh, $50,000 for the next year as well. Uh, this is a it's very, it's very, yeah. more, very rewarding, and it flows a, a lot with what your philosophy and things are. Are the yeah. the vets which is a physical, mostly physical disability? Well, it varies. They have okay. to be officially classified as I think it is at least thirty percent disabled by the federal government. Okay. So okay. this is a, a you know a, an official condition that they have, and it varies from hearing, sight, uh, uh, to physical uh, sure. impairments. And but I'll tell you, you won't find a more dedicated, committed, oh, yeah. great group of people. Yeah, it's a wonderful, it's a good program. Now, Discovery uh, Discovery Park, the Burton D. Morgan Center for Entrepreneurship, uh, which you're the co-director. He'll make a, uh, you've got some things going out there. It's also the 
you got you give a certificate and you've got uh, several programs going for graduates and undergraduates programs so you tell us about that well uh about you two were years. on it before and now yeah, you're the co-director yeah he's back <laughs> uh, well i think it was about 2000 or 2001 i have to go back and check my records right. I, I became the inaugural director as well as dean of Cranert, director of the burton d morgan center for entrepreneurship and i was involved in two initiatives um, to get this off the ground uh, one was an initiative uh, to the Burton D. Morgan Foundation uh, with our wonderful alumnus, Burt Morgan, uh, to um, fund a building. So that turned out to be, I think, about a $7 million gift uh, from the Burton D. Morgan Foundation as involved in writing the proposal to them, which, uh, again, uh, uh, to their everlasting credit, uh, the current uh, director, uh, Deb Hoover, is just a great supporter, and we owe them a lot. Um, and the other uh, thrust was the uh, uh, the funding that was provided by the Lilly Endowment to start Discovery Park, uh, and about 3.2 million of that, uh, I believe the original 23 million was to go to the Burton Morgan Center for Programming. So I helped with that as well, and Bert, uh, certainly uh, Martin Jeske was a big uh, sure. factor in both of these initiatives. Uh, but we uh, were able to get the program funding in the building, so uh, we set this up as a, a, a kind of an engagement outreach activity uh, meant to bring value to our students, faculty, uh, researchers, uh, to help them uh, understand and learn about the commercialization process, learn about how to create your own company, learn about business planning. So we had some natural uh, fit for the uh, center already with uh, our Burton D. Morgan business plan competition. Right. We started a life sciences business plan competition. We, we brought student projects over there from around the campus. And we started a program uh, where we offered certificates to students and undergraduate students on campus in entrepreneurship uh, based on completion of a 15 credit hour package. And they have over a thousand students in that, in that program right now. What, what does the certificate help them when they, uh, if they want to, what can they use that for? Uh, well, it, to, it helps as them. As an entry point of something. It helps if they want to start their own business okay. or go into a family business or operate in a small business context. And, you know, there's been a lot of challenges in the economy. A lot of the big companies are struggling a bit. Uh, the future, in many ways, rests with entrepreneurship and right. uh, creativity and innovation. And so these folks uh, are familiar with that and hopefully can get out and be part of the success. Right, yeah. Quite, and you got that, uh, your technology realization program is another one out that's uh, under that center, isn't it? Right, that helps the uh, MBA students and, and the doctoral students work on joint projects. And uh, I'm going to uh, rejoin that, uh, already a co-director, and uh, may uh, assume a directorship after a sabbatical next year and, uh, is that what and get going get? again. So it's, I'm exci excited. It's a great program. <laughs> it is. That's right. Um, Search committee. You've been on several search committees. Uh, those are challenges, and you just the most recent one was sort of interesting because it was only internal. Did it make any comment they want? On the well, uh, let me go back and uh, I've been involved in several of these. I, yes, I was really I pleased to chair the, uh, the dean search for engineering uh, when we hired Linda Katehi years back, and I think we brought in a great dean at that point in time. And uh, she moved on to be the provost of Illinois and then later the chancellor, Cal Davis. Uh, but then, uh, I guess the reward for doing something the first time, we got to do it again. So I chaired the Engineering Dean Search Committee again, and we hired Leah Jamison from Internal. Uh, well, you have prior services. experience. You see, that does help. It does help. <laughs> and she's just been a wonderful dean and a terrific individual. I couldn't be more proud of her. Uh, and then this year, uh, I, uh, last year I guess it will be now, I chaired our search committee for vice president for human resources, which is a brand new position. Right. We just announced uh, uh, Luis uh, Lewin to be the new uh, human resource VP, and he's going to do a wonderful job. He was the head resource person at the Tribune companies for many years, and uh, most recently at Ohio University, their head resource, uh, resource human resource person. That's a new position. Isn't new position, right. going to be very important to the university. Right. Uh, then I got a call to, into the uh, office of the president. Of course, you never know what that's going to involve. Maybe lunch. And uh, we had found out just a few weeks earlier that uh, our great provost, uh, Randy Woodson, had taken right. a job at uh, North Carolina State as chancellor. And uh, she decided to uh, select from inside uh, for a successor to, to Randy. Uh, Randy had a very aggressive timeline for when they wanted him to start at North Carolina State. 
Uh, she didn't want a gap or an interim situation, so she said, uh, well, I think we had uh, you know, about four or five weeks to uh, right. have an internal search and try to come up with a, a nominee that uh, she could take to the, uh, actually she would make the appointment and, and make the uh, announcement and uh, bring it to the Board of Trustees on February 11th, and I think it was early, like first week of January, we started this of 2010. Um, but we had a great committee to work with, and we did do a lot of due diligence and due process here. Uh, I called every nominee from campus, or 25 names, talked to every one of them. Uh, we had several people apply. Uh, we narrowed the list down to three finalists. Uh, they went through a public forum, in, and they went also through an interview process with deans mm -hmm. and, and the president, the board of trustees, uh, administrative officers. And we ended up with a great uh, selection, Tim Sands. Uh, very capable person, bright, well-respected. One of the things I like about Tim is he's got this uncanny ability to be calm, cool, and collected. <laughs> we need <And> that. <laughs> working in, in higher administration for years and the three C's. And provost, that's an extremely <laughs> nice set of attributes to have. <laughs> oh, have you ever been a faculty fellow it, what, since you've been here? Were you a faculty fellow at any of the residence halls? Never did that, no. I've okay. uh, just been too busy, but I certainly like that program. It and, is, uh, it's good, but you know, I think it's changed a lot because now that the uh, eating facilities, they sort of consolidated. And we, I used to have a pack fellow talking about, oh, I miss that. Mm -hmm. And uh, because you used to get together with them over there, you know. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's talk about some of your nice awards that you've gotten quite a few uh, teaching awards. You're on the, uh, you're founding member of that, uh, for the um, new piece through the Task Force, the Association of Advanced Collegiate School of Business. You've been pretty involved with that association. Well, yeah, I'm not a founding member. It actually started in 1916. Yeah, but the, no, the, this particular, this new piece through Commerce is oh, a new I committee. Right, is a founding right, member. Yes. That's it, new. Stand corrected. There exactly you go. Right. Right. Exactly yes, right. I know. I, I jotted down the year. <laughs> I, I found that out. Well, I, I became involved with the ACSB, which is the accreditation body, and also the kind of Dean's Association for Business Schools uh, many years ago, but became very involved when I became Dean at Craner. So uh, a great organization. The executive director, John Fernandez, is terrific there. Uh, and they have uh, one of the reasons why it's a great organization is they do more than just accredit schools. Uh, he's a visionary, so we, we globalized and we're adding value to business schools and also to society, which I, again, get back to my um, strong belief that we need to be doing this. Uh, and this Peace Through Commerce initiative was uh, uh, an attempt to uh, involve the, the UN uh, uh, to um, try to uh, get a commitment from business schools for uh, recognizing that uh, you know, people are people around the world, that economic foundation really is important to a stable society, and, uh, you know, if people are, are getting some benefits from uh, a nice job, the economy is going along well, uh, they see things working out, they can provide help to their families, uh, they're a little less likely to be in the streets, uh, you know, right. uh, maybe not totally unlikely, but uh, we think that provides a solid foundation for uh, world peace. All right, and it's, it's a leveling. To some extent. Absolutely, yeah. Right. So, um, so we're, I still believe in that, and it's, it's still moving forward. All right. And you're on the, you have been on the board of directors of several things, such as uh, Kite Realty and Royal mm -hmm. Coder. What do you, are you still on the boards for those? Right. Uh, Kite Realty is an Indianapolis based public company uh, mm -hmm. that uh, I serve on the board there, a wonderful company. It's a REIT, Real Estate Investment Trust. A little bit tough on the economy lately, but it's got a great management team. and. I think we'll uh, We're come back strong. It. We'll do it. <laughs> and Roll Coder is a private company that um, also headquartered in Indi Indianapolis. So, so you know, a couple of boards help, I think, enrich uh, my uh, experiences and, and help me keep uh, current with what's going on in business and industry to, mm -hmm. to help with our programs and our students. Right, exactly. And you're on, you, when you were out at Oklahoma, you were on the First Fidelity Bank on the mm -hmm. board of directors out there. Um, Professional associations, uh, do you st one of the Institute of Management Consultants, are you still? Well, that was years ago. I, did, I used to do a lot more of that, and they, they, they okay. kind of fell by the wayside a little bit with my dean's job. Okay. I think okay. you've got to make some choices, and I was uh, more interested in helping credit raising money than doing some individual consulting. So, uh, Sigma Iota Epsilon? Uh, that's just a, a member of that. That's okay. an honorary Alrighty. type of group. Community yeah. service. Let's talk about that. You're on United Way, and you were chief of the economic development out there in in uh, Oklahoma? Well, United Way goes back to my years at Indiana University. Okay. Again, I feel very strongly trying to give back and helping. And I got uh, some uh, 
some opportunities to be involved with the uh, National United Way of America in Alexandria, Virginia. So I actually was one of the people that uh, organized and taught in their management development program for their uh, professionals and their volunteers. And did that for many years, enjoyed that very much, and it was a nice thing to be able to do. I uh, chaired the United Way campaigns at Oklahoma and Purdue. Right, that's right. And I uh, was uh, very pleased with that. And, and I got involved with the economic development in, in Norman and Oklahoma City area. They uh, put together a, a group with a coalition of the business community, uh, the um, uh, university, and also had uh, the Chamber of Commerce involved there. So that worked very well. And, uh, I want to talk about community service because that's really, and your students in the school, you have the management, and that's kind mm -hmm. of, that's been very key. Yeah. And now, as you, and something I read, it's engagement, but community service mm -hmm. has really, really taken hold. Really important for and students. And it impacts too, on, yeah. on, on everyone's lives, and I think mm -hmm. it's good, it's good experience for the yeah. students too as well. Well, I think we all have an obligation to give back, and students need to uh, not only be aware of this, because I think it'll help their careers and help society when they graduate, but uh, one of the things, if you do it, the feeling you get of the reward is something that can't be really taught. So uh, we try to have as many opportunities for our students as possible to, in the community or, or even around the world, frankly, to, right. to help uh, give back uh, with some voluntary services. And, you know, once they do it, they want to do it again. That's right. Uh, leadership. You want to make a couple of comments? You made given some papers and things on that. Uh, mm -hmm. Leadership. That's good. Uh, I'll leave it up to you. Well, I'm looking forward to getting back and teaching in that area there some. So, okay. Uh, that'll be... That's uh, a perfect time. That's a good yeah. question, Catherine. That'll be... It's a great question, Catherine. Yeah. All the questions. <laughs> You're doing a wonderful job. Um, but, you know, leadership, I think, is critically important to uh, success, economic success, political success, whatever. Organizations have to have leaders. So the question is, what kind of leaders? And I think you know, highly ethical uh, leaders with integrity and leaders who can... Uh, move the enterprise forward and help other people succeed. I think those are the kind of leaders you're looking for. So how do you do that? Well, uh, certainly I think uh, being able to garner the resources, uh, not only financial, but uh, advice and uh, direction that people need to, to be successful. Uh, leaders need to be able to do that, knowing when to give direction, when not to. Uh, sometimes people are kind of just better left to use their own skills. And other times though, you need to be pretty directive. So being able to Determine when each style is appropriate, very important. Uh, uh, being inspirational, being uh, uh, respected. I think all these things are important. Uh, you need to show energy, you need to show uh, commitment. You know, very few leaders over the course of the centuries have been boring people. One of you the know? things that you, there's no consensus of whether whether they're born or if it's learned. Okay, I said boring, be, by bo the way. Oh, boring, okay. There, there are rather, very few boring. boring leaders around. Or, but the born versus learned, that's, that's right. a debate that goes on. That's right. Uh, it's probably some blend. Some people may be born with a little more extrovert, uh, uh, a little more, uh, you know, of a, uh, ability to, to communicate, maybe, let's say. Uh, and that's certainly part of leadership. But I think you can learn and develop a lot of your leadership skills. So I always say that you maybe start at a different point than somebody else, but everybody can get better. Where does mentoring, does mentoring play a role, do you think, in the development of the leader and leadership? Absolutely. Okay. You want to help other people succeed, so mentoring is part of that. But you also want to have a succession plan in place, if at all possible. And uh, One of your biggest benefits as a leader should be watching others succeed. And that requires mentoring frequently to uh, help them do that. Right. I agree with you on yeah, that. Very, very few... Uh, Bor uh, boring leaders and very few long-term successful leaders who are selfish. Agreed. All right. In fact, the uh, Gabisa, the one the World Food Prize, commented on mentoring and the people that have been and he saw, that helped him, and he's done the same for others. And and that's yeah. what you're saying. That's a role yeah. that is really key yeah. in a leadership part. I think. Especially I think as you move through uh, your career, move through life, the more senior you get, it's even more important to recognize that you, we need to have the uh, people following us who can right. improve things even more, and heaven knows there's needs for improvement. That's right. Um, what prints on your 11 years as dean and the next stage? And I'll leave the following com closing comments to you. Okay. Well, again, or something that I did not <laughs> ask. Very proud of, of Rawls Hall. I think that's a legacy. Again, I didn't personally certainly do it, but I was part of the team that did it, and I just I couldn't be prouder. And every time I walk by the building or Go in the building. I, I feel great, and so that that's a great uh, uh, that's a great accomplishment for Cranert, really, to have that uh, facility available for many years to come. 
Uh, the recent improvements in the Craner building itself, we were able to give our undergraduates uh, the Webster undergraduate suite uh, area to have advising and uh, students can come with their parents and friends to look at Craner and decide whether they want to come here or not. And it's a world class uh, facility now and that's a great improvement. We just opened that last year. That's a, that's a wonderful thing too. So our, our graduate MBA, largely master's level programs, uh, benefit a lot from Rawls Hall, as do other programs, but the undergraduate programs in particular from the new Webster undergraduate program suite. So I'm pleased about that. We've been able to take the number of uh, named faculty positions or endowed positions from 9 to 21 and have a couple others in the works before I get out and be able to do a couple more. And I'm very pleased about that. Uh, my goal was to get to about 25, so we're close. Uh, but that allows us to attract and retain world-class faculty right. when you've got those kind of positions. Uh, to offer. Um, we brought in, uh, I, I would uh, estimate, uh, uh, since I've been the dean, uh, over $100 million to uh, Craner, and that's been certainly, uh, I think, a nice thing to be able to, to look at as far as helping students mm -hmm. and faculty and staff to, right. uh, you know, continue world-class uh, education. Right. Are you, and you're looking, you're going back to teaching, you're looking forward, and then you continue your research, is that also? What was your plan? Are you, and you're, are you going on a sabbatical? June 30th, what? I uh, leave the, I step down from the dean's job and after 11 years here and uh, wish my successor well. Do go on a sabbatical uh, until uh, January 1st, 2011. And, and then I'm returning to uh, likely have a, a role with the Burton D. Morgan Leadership Center. That's uh, just about finalized, but not quite. Uh, and also uh, would uh, uh, continue with my faculty uh, activities of research and some teaching. Okay, sounds very good. Thank you very much, Dean Kosher. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that very yeah, much. Well, thank My you. Pleasure. It was a great My interview. Pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think mentoring is.